right, I think we're going to start our event now. So first of all, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, this is our last webinar uh, before, the, uh, before the competition closes. Uh, so um, just for those of you who haven't joined us before, uh, my name is Angelina Vrisevic and I'm the program manager um, at the US-UK Fulbright Commission and I look specifically after postgraduate awards. Um, I'm joined by my colleague Tom today who will be helping with me with your questions and also we have two guest speakers which is very exciting. Uh, they will introduce themselves in due course uh, but first I would like to uh, give a very short presentation as usual um, and today we'll be looking specifically at partner awards um, and that will be followed by your questions. So um, as I said, this is the last webinar uh, we're running this, this season and uh, recently I've been receiving um, a lot of queries from you uh, regarding specific partner awards. So I thought I would go through some of them uh, in case you have had a similar query but haven't had a chance to reach out to me to ask a question. Um, right. So um, there are two main types of, of the awards we offer um, and the first ones uh, they come from our uh, partners and those are the partners who uh, offer a contribution towards uh, your tuition fees and living costs in the US and they are mainly for um, a specific academic area um, anywhere in the US. So the first and the largest category is the awards which offer up to $45,000 we also have two awards up to $60,000 and one award, which is the most generous, it's up to $70,000. Now, first of all, I'd like to clarify what this up to actually means. Uh, first of all, the main piece of advice, do not worry about it. When you apply, it's fairly safe to assume that you're going to get the maximum amount of money. Now, what sometimes happens is that our uh, grantees manage to secure a lot of extra funding from other organizations and their host institution as a result of which they end up having more money than they actually need to cover their tuition fees, living expenses and you know, any additional uh, university costs. In this case, we may readjust our funding simply because we are not allowed to duplicate uh, the kind of the the purpose of, of the funding we provide but as i've said that happens in relatively rare circumstances and the majority of the vast majority of our grantees get the maximum amount which is advertised on our website so in terms of the specific awards i would like to point out that we have two uh, awards from uh, the sir Samuel taylor memorial foundation for social entrepreneurship and we also have two Global Wales Awards. Now, the Global Wales Awards are different. They're not identical. So one grant is specifically for a master's programme. Uh, it's up to $45,000. And it is very similar to the all disciplines, with the main difference being the fact that you are expected to come back to Wales and use the knowledge and expertise you will have acquired in the US. Um, and the other award, I think, is up to $25,000. And that is specifically for PhD studies. So if you are a PhD, student uh, at a Welsh university and you would like to go to the US uh, for research placement, this award is for you. Um, so the BAFTA scholarship and elsewhere, BAFTA is probably the most competitive partner award we have. So it kind of competes with the old disciplines in terms of how competitive it is. Um, I often get asked about what we actually mean by the project. Uh, because if you look at our instructions, uh, you will realize that in the study objective, you need to elaborate on the project you're planning to conduct uh, in the US. Um, and we do appreciate the fact that if you're applying for the BAFTA scholarship, it's fairly likely that your course is going to be in a way more applied than let's say a master's in, in political theory and that's perfectly fine. So I would suggest that you approach this whole issue of the project in a broader way. So think about the project you want to work on as let's say as a filmmaker in the future. Think about your career project, your sort of professional development project and talk about that in your study objective. Uh, the Elsevier Award. Now uh, the question I get about this award a lot of the time is whether it has to be a master's in data analysis. Now it does not. Uh, if you are interested in this award, I very strongly encourage you uh, to check out the web, the LCDS website. Uh, it gives a really good idea of research they're interested in, they're involved in. And just kind of to give you an example, so one of the areas they're particularly keen on uh, is medical studies. And our current LCD grantee is, is a doctor doing a medical studies program in the US. 
Um, and finally, in this particular category, we have the Entrepreneurship Award. Now, this is a new award, and it's a very generous one. Uh, it can be applied to any MBA in the US as long as it's not Harvard Business School. Now, we are obviously aware of the fact that kind of the traditional MBA in the US is spread over two years. Now, if you're willing to look outside the Ivy League, and if you're willing to look at probably the areas not as kind of as fancy as New York, for example, uh, you it, it is it is possible to find degrees uh, which um, can be pretty much fully covered by seventy thousand dollars. So this is this is something to keep in mind if you're interested in an MBA and the financial side of it is is a concern to you. Um, the other category of the awards um, are our part specific US university partners, and those tend to be not just for just a specific discipline, but also at a specific institution. So um, as I've just mentioned, uh, the Entrepreneurship Award is not suitable for Harvard Business School. And the reason for that is the fact that we have a partnership with uh, the British Friends of Harvard Business School. So the award, uh, so on the website, you will read that the award is normally up to $45,000, but this award is in a way um, a financially uh, need-based scholarship. So uh, our partners have supported our grantees very generously and it has gone above $45,000. Having said that, I do want to point out that this, the, the MBA at Harvard is an expensive course. So it is very likely that you will need additional funding. Uh, the New York University Wagner Award, it's quite a niche program and quite quite an interesting award, quite different from everything else we offer. So the course is uh, one year long and you go to the US for one term only and that's your first term. The US term is fully funded, so the tuition fees are waived and you get a living stipend. Uh, however, when you come back to the UK, you come back to London and you complete your program at UCL and um, unfortunately we are unable to support you with, with that bit of funding. So you will have to look into that yourself. Uh, this uh, program, uh, sorry, this award also requires some work experience, but it is very popular uh, with uh, public sector employees. Um, I've grouped the next two awards together, so it's Minnesota Public Policy Award and Indiana uh, Law Award, uh, because they offer the same financial package, so it's a full tuition fee waiver. Um, now, something people are not always aware of is the fact that both Minnesota and Indiana are located in one of the cheapest um, regions of the US in terms of uh, living costs. Uh, so if you're able to or if you're willing to negotiate with your universities and maybe have a frank conversation about your financial circumstances, you may be able to get an additional scholarship, a stipend, something else to support you and in the end you will end up with a fully funded award. So if you're interested in either public policy or law, I would very strongly encourage you to uh, to look at, at these awards. And finally, we have um, a PhD award with Brown University. Now, this is the most generous award we have at the moment. Uh, so it offers uh, a complete a full tuition fee waiver with a generous monthly stipend and also medical and dental insurance are covered. And you get that throughout the five years of your study in the US. Obviously, the thing to keep in mind that this is for PhD specifically, and Brown University is an Ivy League institution, so you can expect the um, application process, the selection process to be quite competitive. Uh, so this is the information I, I wanted to share with you today. I'm going to stop sharing my screen in a moment. Right, thank you. And normally, we would now move on to the Q&A session. However, I've invited two of our grantees to come and join me, and both of them said yes. So I'm absolutely delighted to introduce to you uh, Rosie Ellis and Tam Trin, who are in the US at the moment. They're current grantees, and they they also applied uh, for our partner awards, and they are happy to talk to you a little bit about their experience in the US. Right, Rosie, Tam, are you happy to, to turn the cameras on? Are we happy to go ahead? Oh, oh, here we go. Right, Tam, are you, are you happy to go first and tell us a little bit about your award and, and your experience in the US? Yes, definitely. Thank you very much, uh, Angelina, for the introduction. Um, so, um, Angela has asked me to just share a little bit about uh, basically what it is that I study and my sort of process of applying for like the, the kind of uh, partner awards and my experiences so far. So, 
I'll talk a little bit about this, but do feel free to ask questions after. Um, so I'm Tam, and I'm currently studying a master in international and development economics at Yale. Uh, I am a recipient of the Lloyds Award, which is in a degree. It's an award for any degree that is related to risk analysis. Um, I think like I want to talk a bit about like why I chose the Lloyds Award. Um, I think like in thinking of what award I wanted to do, um, I found it very helpful to think like what which one would be the best fit for what it is that I want to do. So I wanted to study sort of economics with like a particular focus on labor economics. And I sort of had a look at a few awards and actually a few of them like look like they could potentially be sort of suitable for my degree. Um, but I think in my research process, I started looking at sort of people who have received this award in the past and like what are the possible kind of things that you could apply for. So. Um, to give you an example, another award that I sort of considered when I was applying is the Reeds Elsevier Award in Data Analysis, which um, basically in economics we use a lot of data, and that is quite strong. Um, so I considered a lot between these two awards um, specifically, um, but I think after reading the profile and the bios of people who have received this award in the past, I sort of have came to the conclusion that actually the Risk Discipline Award is actually better suited to what it is that I wanted to do. And I also found, for example, reading um, with Elsevier, like a lot of people would do like kind of quite strong data analytics in medical science. And whereas like for me, it is actually more related to risk analysis. So that was like a bit of the process um, that I have gone through to decide why this would be the right award for me. Um, I have also applied for the, old, so you could apply to both the partner awards and the old discipline awards. So this doesn't penalize you. So this, um, I didn't know that in the beginning and I thought that was a helpful piece of information that I found out in the application process. Um, so that is a bit about like the award itself. Um, in terms of my experience, um, I basically have moved to the US. I think before I actually moved here, it was slightly it was a bit crazy because there was a lot of different policy change, you know, currently in the time that we live in. Um, like, I think right up until September, um, or like even during August, there was lots of like announcement by the Trump administration about what who can travel and how we could do it. So it's definitely not normal times, and it was a lot of uncertainty. Uh, but like Fulbright definitely has been super helpful in helping you navigate this process. So um, like. You know, with all of that in mind, I think like that really helped my journey to be a lot better. Um, and even coming from the UK, so I sort of my, finally managed to get my visa appointment and I think I traveled uh, with probably in about like two weeks of receiving the visa. Um, so it kind of all happened very quickly, even though I sort of mentally prepare for that um, for some time. Um, I think first coming into the US, there was definitely a bit of a culture shock and again, like we had a orientation beforehand um, that talked to us about, oh, okay, but this is what the culture of the US is going to be like. And you thought, oh, well, you know, the US and the UK culture is probably not that different. Well, it turned out that there's probably is a bit and like the orientation came in super helpful, I think just in terms of what to expect and, and how to do it. Um, and actually being here, even though it's during COVID time, um, it does mean that you could be a bit more immersive in the culture. So even though like, most of my classes are remote. I am able to go out and meet with my classmates, meet with my professors and other people from like clubs and societies that I do here. Um, so yeah, like I think that's kind of a little bit about my experience, but I'll stop here and let Rosie uh, pick this up. Thank you very much, Tom. I'm going to jump in, obviously I need to. Uh, so we've had a policy change so, um, for the for this uh, competition cycle you can apply for one award only I'm, I'm clarifying one award only i get a lot of questions about that and this is because it used to be different so that that has changed we've been instructed to change that so this is just to confirm yet again it's one award only so if you want to go for lloyds you go for lloyds if you want to go for lcv go for lcv if you want to go for the all disciplines you go for all disciplines you can't do the all disciplines and a partner that used to be the case but it is no longer the case so yeah that was that was me uh yes right. 
Okay, thank you both. So hi guys, my name is Rosie. I won the uh, Global Wales Postgraduate Awards and I'm studying a Master's in Education and Social Change at the University of Florida. Um, firstly, in, in terms of picking an award, if you're from Wales, I would 100% say go for the Global Wales Award. Um, it's a great chance to kind of go away, learn and then bring something back to the country. Um, it's the foundation is, is really something I'm interested in and you have a better chance of of getting an award if you if you go for one of these partners awards so if you're thinking about it definitely go for it um, in terms of choosing a university I would say in the application process be thorough look through I know that a lot of people kind of gravitate towards the Ivy Leagues in terms of Harvard and Yale and things, but there are so many great options out there and I would encourage you all to explore as many universities as you can, talk to the professors, look at what programs might suit you best um, and then go from there. In terms of getting here, like, like Tam said, it was a bit strange with the whole Corona crisis, but Fulbright have been fantastic in helping you through every step of the process in getting your visa, getting here, making sure you feel comfortable and you have everything you need. Um, it is a little bit daunting. Moving across the country can be uh, a bit scary, but you'll find your feet within a couple of weeks. And the opportunities that are here kind of outweigh the missing home and things. Uh, in terms of the benefits of cross-cultural exchange, I'd say it's fantastic. You don't realize until you get here what you can actually learn from being around people who are different to you and to emphasize with other people and what they've been through and to learn about like different systems and different societies and how they Im impact whatever you're studying. Um, it's also quite fun when people don't really know what you're saying, they ask you to clarify all your funny British phrases. It's a good way to make friends, a bit of an icebreaker, especially if you have a Welsh accent, you'll be good. Um, in terms of application, if you're, so I'm, my, I'm doing my master's, but I'm 21, which is people find a bit strange here. And if you haven't got too much life experience, I wouldn't be too put off in terms of writing your application. It's really important, I think, for me to talk about your motivations and what you want to do and what your aims are and what your goals are and how that connects to you as a person. One thing in terms of writing your application would be keep it focused on you know, what makes you you? What is your reason for doing this? And what do you hope to achieve? And I think that tells a lot about you to the Fulbright committee um, and can put you in a, in a good standing to get an award. Um, yeah, I, oh, another big thing for me was, obviously the amount of money is fantastic and it's, it's brilliant, but it still can be really, really expensive. Going to university in America is, Ooh, a lot of money, especially if you're an international student. So one thing in looking around at your universities, definitely, definitely ask them if they have any ways that they can support you. So I got a tuition waiver from international to in-state fees for the University of Florida, which knocks about $40,000 off your um, fees each year, which can, can really help you manage uh, the financial side. But yeah, any questions, just let me know. Lovely. Well, Tam and Rosie, thank you very much for uh, your little presentations. Um, I think we will start taking questions now. Uh, so we have the Q&A option. So please uh, feel free uh, to submit your questions. Um, and myself um, and, and my colleagues uh, will be happy to answer them. Okay. So I kick off, Angelina, because we've yeah. got a few straight away. Um, I, I think the first question is, is I'm going to give to you, Angelina, because it's quite technical, but I wonder if Rosie could speak a bit more about it afterwards in general, because it's specifically about the Welsh Award. Uh, so they're saying, do you have to be doing your PhD at a Welsh university for the Global Wales Award? Um, a Welsh PhD student at a non-Welsh university would not be eligible for the award? Is that what is, they are asking? Uh, is that the case? Uh, so, Angelina, could you just clarify the Welsh eligibility? Yes, so as I said, we have two uh, different uh, Global Wales Awards. So if you, are, if you are now a PhD student who wants to go to the US uh, to do part of your research in the US as part of your 
let's say, British PhD, then you need to be studying in Wales at a Welsh university. That is a key requirement. Now, if you're thinking to go to the US uh, to do your full PhD there, and you are interested in applying for the um, all disciplines, um, at the moment, it's specifically for masters. But if you are in, if this is the case, if let's say you you you're Welsh or you've lived and worked in in Wales for a long period of time, um, and you are interested in doing PhD and applying for the Global Wales Award, drop us an email and we will check whether um, that would be applicable to PhD study as well. I guess maybe kind of to follow up on that, um, in terms of the Welsh uh, Postgraduate Award. Rosie, do you want to just speak a bit about, because I believe you went to the University of Exeter, so not in Wales, is that right? So that, yeah, could you so speak I a bit about to, your experience? Yeah, I went to the University of Exeter in England, so I, I was born in Wales, grew up in Wales, but I did my undergraduate degree in Exeter, um, and then I moved back to Wales, and I just applied as a someone who's grown up in Wales uh, to go for the opportunity that, and I think part of the Global Wales Award is that once you go study, you come back to Wales and then you work and kind of give that knowledge back into Wales. I think that's the that's the key, I'm, Angelina, I think. Yes, absolutely. Right and there. this is something you will be strongly assessed on during the uh, the application and the interview yeah. uh, process because uh, that award is partly funded by, by the Welsh government. And obviously, you know, the idea is, as, as Rosie has just said, is that you come back to Wales and use the knowledge and your, your experience, your expertise you will have applied in the US. So that would be a kind of a very important part of your application. Yeah, definitely. definitely. Right. Any questions about that, just let me know. Um, so just another technical one. Uh, is it possible to apply for an MBA uh, to do the Social Entrepreneurship Award, Angelina? Uh, yes, that is possible. Uh, so with the Social Entrepreneurship Award, we actually uh, consider a very wide uh, variety of options. And I think at the moment we have two grantees and neither of them is doing an MBA, but this is this is something uh, which is absolutely possible. And with this particular award, it's very much about the actual project you are suggesting to do. So an MBA is perfectly fine. Um, so next question, someone is asking, if you're applying for a postgraduate award to continue work on your PhD with an American professor, does a project have to be 12 months long? If it's less than 12 months, how would this affect you, the funding you receive? Uh, so I guess that's asking about the eligible, like the kind of terms of yeah, that. So in term, in, oh, sorry, yeah. In terms of the duration, uh, it has to be between uh, four and 12 months. Um, so the maximum is 12 months, the minimum would be four months. Now, in terms of the funding, that would be a bit of a... So I would be working with you directly to establish that, but normally uh, before we do sort of like determine what funding you're eligible for, we ask you to let us know whether your university is going to charge you anything for doing research with them. Uh, we will be asking, kind of looking into your living costs. Uh, and, and obviously your living costs then and the duration of your grant will determine how much you need to be able to spend there to live there. So it's... it's um, quite quite a few considerations uh but you can uh, depending on if, if you're going for for the whole year you can uh especially if you're going to a relatively expensive place uh you can expect to get the maximum amount we've got a, a, a i think a good a kind of it's quite a straightforward question here but i think it's a good opportunity to hear from rosie and tam as well so actually you can clarify the basic bit which is that in terms of the application process, do people need to apply both to Fulbright and to their chosen university? That's yeah. So I will ask this very uh, answer this very briefly. Yes, and uh, do keep in mind that the processes are separate. So it's your you need to do your homework on finding out all the different deadlines. And I think Rosie and Tam can share a little bit of kind of their experience how they manage that kind of multitasking. Yeah. So if I could ask you guys to maybe just talk about your own experience of. of so you obviously applied to Fulbright, but then you also submitted those applications to uh, the US University. So like, how did you go about that? Like, what, how did you manage all those create, like, different deadlines? Uh, Tam, did you, would you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I think like Andrea said, they are separate processes. You apply for the university and you apply for Fulbright separately. Um, in terms of applying for universities, 
I think definitely do your research. So find out um, there are just so many different universities that offer different types of program. There are some very specific programs if there is like a specific things that you want to do. I think that's also like one of the great things about the US is that it's really diverse in terms of the different things that they offer. So um, like just look for different places as they kind of, there's just a lot of them. Once you find out exactly who they are and you know what they offer, if they are of interest to you, find out what are the eligibility criteria. So what do they actually require you to do? Um, do they need to have you know, a specific discipline beforehand, um, find out what their deadlines are. I mean, importantly, find out how much they cost because that would also impact like whether you can actually afford to go there. Um, so I think like once you do that, create a spreadsheet of what they are and then as I guess to start working through them. If you want narrowing down, um, for me, I talk to a lot of my friends and my professors as well. And I think like for, for example, options that were closed together, I particularly talk to my professors and ask them what their opinions are of the course, like what, you know, if they know anything about it, you might be able to find out a little bit more. Um, if you can have people who kind of attended that program that, you know, they might be able to put you in touch with and you can talk to them and find out a little bit more what the courses are. Um, I think the university also has lots of events to like promote their courses. So if they offer them, you can sign up for them and find out and ask, uh, ask them yourself. So yeah, definitely go through this process, um, but the deadlines are there. They really vary. Some universities, the deadlines are like quite early. I think some that I applied to were like in the beginning of December. Some were like a lot later in January, February. So definitely find out the deadlines are and don't miss it. I think. Another thing is that US University also requires GRE so, uh, or GMAT depending on your discipline. So make sure that you get basically you plan for those beforehand because the, the application deadlines will sort of come up very quickly and you want to make sure that you sort of are well prepared for all of them. That's great. Thank you. Tam. Um, Rosie, could you want to speak a bit about your experience and like how you went about uh, like applying to those US universities as well? Yeah, sure. Um, I think the most important thing is start applying as soon as possible. Um, just start getting the applications out there. Like Tam said, do your research, look at the universities, which might be most suitable for you and the programs that are best for you. If you need to do the GRE or anything like that, get it booked in advance and start studying because it's hard. <laughs> um, also just look around and like I said before, look outside the Ivy Leagues, look at universities you haven't thought of, do your research, get in touch, make connections with the professors and the program managers and the what universities have to offer. Um, apply to as many as you would like because there's no harming it. And um, so if you miss a deadline, don't panic. I know a few times they'll just say yeah and you can still put that in. That's great, thank you. Um, I've got a couple more very sort of straight, straightforward questions so I'm just going to fire those at Angelina um, and some of them are about quite specific things but still relevant. Um, so, I, so a question about the applying for the entrepreneurship and the Harvard award, uh, is it possible and I, is this, is it, I wonder if this is an exception, um, do you uh, can one apply to the entrepreneurship learning board and still be available for the Harvard Business School award? And if successful, would you be available? Uh, able, yeah, sorry. And if successful, would you be eligible for the British Friends Award? Um, so, what's I guess what's the relationship between the applying for the MBA awards that we offer? Um, I'm not sure. I uh, I, I may need some help with this question. Sorry, uh, so basically, about... the you you have to choose. Um, what um which 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 one you want to apply for uh so that that's basically if so if you're interested in a, in applying to um harvard only uh you you can it, actually the deadline is also a bit different for harvard that's that's normally in april so uh you apply for that particular scholarship uh if you're considering multiple scholarships uh, oh sorry multiple um universities 
Um, and if, if you're interested in the social entrepreneurship award, especially, uh, sorry, not social the entrepreneurship award, especially given, you know, how generous it is, unfortunately that award cannot really be used uh, towards an MBA at Harvard. So you, you would need to unfortunately make, make a choice in this particular case. Um, and then another, a couple of questions about deferrals. So if people have already got places uh, that they would have um, been offered this year, but they've deferred them to next academic year, are they able to apply with those places in kind of in the hand, as it were? That, that's actually a very good question. Uh, so yes, it's fine to defer um, a place you may be holding at the moment. Uh, something to keep in, that, in mind is that uh, US universities offer different start dates. So if, very often you have two or three start dates throughout the academic year. Now with the Fulbright grant, the earliest you can start a course as a Fulbright grantee uh, will be July 2021. Uh, so I would be encouraging you to look at August, September 2021, if you can, um, for a start date. Uh, but if you wish to defer, that's fine. We will just need um, an official letter from your institution that you've deferred. So that's not a problem. So here's an, another question that um, I think Angelina will answer in the kind of basic sense. And then I think we can uh, maybe turn to the, our grantees to get a bit more detail in their perspective. So, can you apply for scholarships? The question is, can you apply for scholarships at the colleges and universities as well as the Fulbright Award? Um, so, Angelina, I think it's quite a simple answer to that one. Yes, and, and we definitely encourage you to do so. And I think Rosie uh, can touch uh, upon that issue a little bit, but she's, she mentioned that she got a very good deal from the University of Florida. Yeah, I was super lucky. I got a great deal. <laughs> It's definitely worth when you apply to just ask them, hey, I'm a Fulbright student. Would there be any extra funding available to me to help with the tuition costs and things like that? Because my award won't cover international fees are just very expensive um, in the US. So it's really worth sending someone an email with just find the contact. It'll be on their website and just asking them. You can look on their page for the scholarships, but it's also I didn't see one on there for me, so I just emailed and asked, and they said that they have a pot of money spare for Fulbright students who need like assistance, and therefore they drop your tuition down to an in-state tuition. So even if you don't see it on the page, if you're applying somewhere, just email, ask them, because there's a chance that they're going to be able to help you out, and it, it does make a huge difference. De so definitely ask Tuition waivers are also a good way to go. So um, if there's not a scholarship, that, that might be an option. But yeah, absolutely. Definitely. And I just cannot overemphasize how, how important and how true that actually is. Very often you can get a scholarship or some sort of a discount simply because you're a Fulbright uh, grantee. Yeah. So it's, it has nothing to do with your financial circumstance. It's also, again, very common to offer financial support if you find yourself in kind of challenging financial circumstances so absolutely do uh reach out and try to have a chat with someone uh directly at the university you are you're keen on attending um we've got a quick specific question about the elsevier award uh basically asking so where can i find more information about the elsevier award and the types of research included i'm um, hoping to do a master's related to biology would this be applicable uh well Google. <laughs> that is the short answer to this question. Um, the LCB organization, um, it's a foundation, their website, they, they, because they work obviously in research, they publish a lot of stuff. Uh, so just, just go and have a look at what, what is happening on the website. In terms of uh, the area, again, as I've said, uh, they, they are willing to be very um, kind of, uh, they're willing to consider very different areas. So it's, yeah, it, it really depends on your project it, uh, because your area is related uh, to medical studies. And I know this is one of the sort of like relatively hot topics uh, that sounds plausible to me, but it does really depend on the project uh, or on the application of all you end up submitting. Something again, I often get asked is, so I get an email saying, hi, I'm, I want to apply for a ward X. I'm studying, you know, discipline, Y, whatever. Uh, it's very difficult for us to advise whether you are eligible to apply for a specific award because we don't see your project proposal. Until we have your application with your study objective, we are not going to know uh, if, your, um, 
if your idea, if your uh, proposed project is suitable for that award. Also, do keep in mind that your application will be reviewed by the partner, and this is a decision we will be making all together. So, you know, I also can't really predict what the partner is going to say. Although we, we try to be as flexible and as kind of uh, broad-minded as we can. So we always give you the benefit of the doubt if, if there are any doubts. Great. There's a couple more kind of, sort of more technical questions. So um, if you're applying to do, uh, I guess another way of phrasing this would be, are there any other, we've already talked about the Welsh, Wales Award for the PhD research. Um, are there any other partner awards that are also applicable for doing um, you know, research trips for, for a PhD or, or is the only option the All Disciplines Award? So if you're interested in doing a placement, so you're doing a PhD, let's say in the UK, and you want yeah. to go to the US for six months to do particular research because let's say of a lab available only in the US. Uh, so that would be either the um, Global Wales or the Welsh Award um, or the All Disciplines. Uh, if you're interested in general doing a PhD, I would definitely recommend that you look, look up the um, sort of Brown University, but that's, that would be for the whole PhD uh, degree. I guess, uh, and Angelia, am I right in thinking that it's also possible to apply for the All Disciplines Award to do the first year of a longer PhD program? Yes. Um, yeah. um, okay, so I think this question is another one that we can ask uh, Rosie in terms of maybe uh, speak to as well. So someone's asking if it's possible to kind of do an internship or something, do off campus activities and work experience while studying your master's. Um, I guess, Angelia, A, is that allowed? Uh, yes, it is allowed. So you would be working. So um, as a Fulbright grant, you will have um, an advisor based in the US who will be helping you with all kind of this kind of immigration work, complicated things, which I don't know about. Uh, but I know that you are allowed to work. Um, there, I think there, are, there is a specific number of hours, potentially like a specific area or areas in which you're allowed to work. But it is, it is possible. And I wonder if Tam and Rosie can share their experience, if they have had any or any discussions they might have had uh, with their colleagues on, on this topic. Yeah, in terms of speaking to people who received the Fulbright Award last year, they uh, told us that it's, it is difficult because obviously winning an award, your focus needs to be on your academic study here. So they are kind of particular about what you do and how, how many hours, but there definitely is the opportunity to do it. Um, especially if you're looking for an internship or research internship whilst you're studying in within the university um, there's options there and that's something like Angelina said that your IE advisor will help you go through but the opportunity is there it, it can be a little bit complicated but if that's something you're interested in then yeah you can you can you can follow through and find out about that there's um a lot of people who won the awards last year did that so um, the opportunity is there yeah, I think um, Rosie has pretty much covered it. I think that the one criteria they look for is like how relatable is your internship to what it is that you study because um, you're kind of there to study this particular subject. So um, I think, yeah, there needs to be some degree of relatability. Thank you, that's, that's great. Um, actually, a more, a more a sort of eligibility question. Um, so this is about previous experience in the United States. Um, so in this particular instance, the, uh, the person asking the question had been a, to the US on a year abroad as part of their undergraduate degree. Um, would they still be allowed to study abroad uh, for a master's uh, through a Fulbright grant? Uh, in terms of the eligibility, yeah, that, that's perfectly fine. So your application would be considered. Something to keep in mind is that we tend to give preference uh, to the applicants who haven't had uh, extensive experience in the US. But then again, we have equally offered our awards to the people who have been to the US before. So um, I would say definitely apply and we will take it from there. Um, another sort of uh, more technical question. So this is about the um, J-1 visa and the, what, what it allows you to do after your grant has finished. So. The question is, I know there are rules with visas and going on to work in the US after studying there. What are the rules with a J-1 visa and then getting a job in the US? Is this something, or, uh, yeah, is, is this something they're allowed to do? 
Uh, so, first of all, I can provide some information, that, but please keep in mind that I'm not legally trained. I'm not an immigration advisor. So this is something, if, if you're interested in it, the responsibility will be with you to research that area. So in terms of the information I can provide, so yes, so uh, after J1, uh, the, because it's an exchange program funded by both, uh, both governments, you will be expected to come back to the UK to use your expertise. Uh, if you want to acquire a more permanent immigration status in the US, for example, you want to apply for the green card, you will need to come back to the UK and spend at least two years uh, in the country which gave you the Fulbright uh, grant. Um, in however, if you want to do something called post-academic training after your program, you can do so. Now, post-academic training is quite sort of a generic concept. It can be uh, a paid internship, which is a job in a way, uh, a fixed contract. Uh, the main condition is, is that this does not exceed the duration of your degree. But then again, I'm not legally trained to advise on that. If you're interested in this option, you will have to discuss that with your advisor when you're already in the US. But in terms of your uh, legal status, you will have to come back uh, to the UK for at least two years if you want to then go back to the US to work there. Um, and so in terms of this is looking at the Alistair Cook Awards in particular, but I think it might be relevant to other awards. Um, when, so, so the, for, is, is, is this um, person right in thinking that there is no writing sample requirement for the Alistair Cook Award? I mean, no like supplemental, supplementary materials. Um, maybe Angelina, you could just run through which um, awards and which um, disciplines require a kind yes. of uh, supplementary material. Sorry, I've made a real meal of that question. No, no, that, that's but, um, fine. I actually did get asked quite a lot uh, this question. So uh, regarding journalism, no, we do not require, genuinely speaking, in terms of word samples, we don't tend to ask for writing samples because your study objective is ultimately your writing sample. You're talking about your project there. Uh, so that's kind of enough for us. Um, we do ask, um, so please do refer to the instructions because I don't remember all, of, but it's normally visual arts, uh, architecture, and I think something else. Normally, if you're applying for filmmaking, uh, something, basically something visual in a way, something we, we want to see music also you can submit some recordings uh, so if it's not writing and it's directly related to your degree you can then submit up to four samples i guess um to follow up on that it might be worth asking rosie and tam if they can maybe talk a bit about like the process of writing those that uh, the, the, the 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 different parts of the the application like um if you're happy to speak a bit about how you went about that and what, what you how that process went. Through. Yeah, maybe just like one or two tips from uh, yeah. each of you, kind of the, the, the key things which you've taken out of that experience. Yeah, don't go through, yeah, sorry. Thanks, Olivia. Um. Yeah, I can, I can answer this. Um, so I think like for me, you know, it's really about thinking about your story, uh, your motivation, what you want to achieve, and like just kind of basically write that down in your Fulbright essays. So you have to write, if I remember, there's two essays, uh, one about your study objective and one is your personal statement. So basically that is your opportunity to sort of like channel your sort of passion and motivation and what it is that you want to study. So think about it and actually do spend some good time thinking about that and writing that down. Um, I know that this Fulbright award is you know, it's very competitive and it might seem a bit daunting, but I think just don't let that dissuade you. Like, don't be discouraged by it. Like, just think about your own story and your motivation. Uh, you can have conversations with friends and people around you that will probably help you through this process, uh, but kind of follow the guidelines, do your research, and I guess, like, sit down and actually write that essay. Yeah, I think Tam's spot on there. Um, for me, you know, you're all clearly very motivated to go study. So just take some time to think about kind of where that motivation has come from, how that links to you as a person. Take some time. I think for me, I kind of wanted to show my personality a bit, especially in, in the one essay. Just try and show a bit about more about who you are and, 
you know your personality and what makes you you because because that is equally as important as a lot of the other academic stuff as well and um, can show a lot more about who you are and what you're going to do and what you're going to bring to the program and what you're going to bring when you when you come back so i'll definitely keep that in mind try and be a bit creative and, and see where it takes you thank you um so uh, okay this is a question for angelina so how many awards are we expecting to offer in for the 2021 program? Um, I wonder if that means the following competition or whether it's this competition. Um, but maybe you could so, speak to both. Yeah, so basically we never know in advance how many grants exactly we'll be able to offer. So with the partner awards, it's always one award per partner unless stated otherwise. So we have two awards uh, for social entrepreneurships, uh, entrepreneurship, sorry, from the Sir Cyril Taylor Memorial Foundation. Uh, and we have two different awards uh, from Global Wales. Everything else is one award per partner. Uh, we've, so it's about, it's going to be about 15 or so. Um, with the all disciplines, uh, this will really depend on our budget and on how much money you need and whether we need to do any readjustment. Uh, because sometimes if, for example, we get a number of, you know, amazing grantees who manage to secure lots of other funding opportunities and somehow we end up with a certain amount of money in our budget, we will definitely offer it to somebody else or we're not going to keep it. Um, but I would say this year we've had... Um, a, so we've got 21, 21 grantees. Uh, so I would say on average, we award between 20 and 25. Now that has gone below and over. Uh, so it does depend on the year, but that's kind of the average number of awards we offer every year. Um, uh, it's kind of the question about PhDs. So um, with your PhD application for a fallback support of PhD, do you have to focus on one PhD proposal only or if are you able to apply to multiple universities with different re research proposals um, and how does that work with that Fulbright, um, uh, Fulbright kind of application which asks you to talk about lots of different universities basically? Um, so in terms of universities, uh, well it should be one specific proposal because we will be funding specific research especially at the PhD level. I'm also, that's, that's just my personal concern, I'm slightly concerned about people applying or well, having different PhD, pro PhD proposals. I mean, I appreciate the fact that you may want to kind of probably focus on slightly different things, but at that academic level, we would probably expect you to know really well what that one thing is, which you really want to focus on. Uh, so it's, it's one study objective in terms of the research you want to do. When it comes to universities, uh, you are, very welcome to apply to more than one institution so that that's very common most of our applicants apply to more than one but do keep in mind that you will need to um provide some reasons for choosing the institutions you're applying to um and with phd applications in most cases um students apply to only one institution because of let's say a specific research center or maybe a specific professor they want to be supervised so they do have very strong kind of research linked reasons why they want to go to that one university again i'm not saying that that has to be the case and you know we will happily consider um, applicants who are potentially thinking about a number of uh, universities but if, if you are in that category do remember to provide a very strong justification for you know the choices you're making basically we, um, we had another question earlier about the basically the timing of the application, the fact that you basically apply for your Fulbright sometimes before you've applied to your institutions in the US. Um, but I was wondering if it was just worth maybe asking Sam and Rosie just to maybe speak about their own timeline experience and like at what point during the year they, you know, when they would have found out they've got the Fulbright grant, but also at what point during that year they, you know, had their places confirmed in the US and like maybe just to kind of give people a bit of a picture of how that might look. That's okay. Tam, I think you deferred. Is it, is it the case? Yeah, yeah so right. I, th I think you, you actually have very different experiences. So please do share a little bit of how you went through that. Yeah, that's right. So I actually apply for universities uh, one year before I apply for Fulbright. So I kind of already know which offers I've received uh, beforehand. Um, I think it was just partly due to my timing. I mean, again, like a lot of these deadlines come up and the applications are long and you need to really think about it. So um, I didn't apply to Fulbright first time round, but I'm, I'm glad I did uh, in, the, in the following year. 
Uh, but this is why I think that it's really important if you are applying to both universities and Fulbright in the same year, then you think about that, um, basically, like really plan ahead. Yeah, definitely. If you're applying to Fulbright now and you're also looking to apply to universities, it's, it's going to feel quite hectic for the next few months. Um, and so prioritize which universities are at the top of your list. Make sure you focus on those. Stick to the deadlines. But like I said, if you miss deadlines, which probably might happen, just email them um, and see because it's always worth asking. Uh, it's slightly strange because you'll probably receive your acceptance to the university before you found out if you've gotten the Fulbright Award. That's okay. It's important to have the office there just in case you do get it. So that might feel a little bit strange, but make sure you are applying to universities um, up until that point, because if you get it, then um, you need to have them ready to go. Because I think, what was it? End of March, we found out when we'd got the award. So by then you should have received a few offers or at least applied to a majority of the universities you're looking at. Um, so it, it feels a bit weird, but just go with it and it will all work out. So just trust in it and you'll be okay. And I also um, want to add that uh, you don't need to have applied or have received any kind of communication from your university by the time you submit your full grant application. So because these processes are completely separate, uh, you, you obviously expect to have done research into your university because this is an important part of your full grant application. But other than that, you don't need to have done um, anything else in terms of the actual application. Um, I, I think a couple more questions uh, just to take us through. Uh, so the first is, but again, a basic, so the question is about whether or not we can give a rough estimate of how many applicants apply for each partner award. Um, but I guess maybe you could talk again, just mention again about how the relative competitive, competitivity of the awards fares. Yeah, so our awards really differ significantly like very, very dramatically in terms of how competitive they are. And also it really depends on the year as well. So the all disciplines is competitive every single year. So we receive hundreds of applications uh, for let's say 10, 11, 13 grants. Uh, now, uh, let's say BAFTA is a new application, a, a new award. Uh, that again can be, you know, tens of applications. So the ratio is kind of similar to the all disciplines in a way. Um, with let's say things like Brown PhD, that is quite niche, so it's, it's very specific. The same goes for let's say the New York Wagner Award we have. We can't really expect you know, hundreds of applications simply because the requirements are quite are very strict and very specific. Uh, so I would say the more requirements you come across when, when reading the um, award description, the less competitive uh, it, the award is likely to be. Then we have like generic, relatively general, such as Global Wales, where you know, uh, you have to be basically somehow connected to Wales, which is you either live in Wales, or you were born in Wales, or you sort of consider yourself Welsh because I know you've spent 10 years working there. So, you know, it, it can be quite flexible in a way. So again, we receive more applications for that award because there are fewer requirements. So I would say this is, this is kind of the way to look at it. Uh, sometimes um, it can be a specific university award. It can be very popular one year, not really popular um, next year. So again, it, it does depend on, on multiple factors. Um, one of the difficult questions is that, you know, if um, essentially are we able to kind of predict what the implications of COVID related travel restrictions would be in terms of how this would affect this year's awards? If I could, I would probably be in a different job. Now, <laughs> don't take it wrong, I love my job. <laughs> no, this is your answer. We can't predict what is going to happen in the world. Um, we can predict that we will do everything we can to get you there. We got Rose and Ham there. They are there. I, I can confirm that. <laughs> um, half of our cohort are in the US at the moment and the other half, hopefully, well, they are planning, we are planning to send them. So hopefully they will be able to go in January or late December. Um, so at the moment, just kind of some general information, um, most of the J um, category visas are not being issued. However, um, our grantees fall under the category of uh, national national interest exemption something. So they've been able to get their visas. So this is happening. This isn't going. It's all going fine. Obviously, we appreciate that you know just, um, 
it's possible that we will all encounter some difficulties. Some people got stopped at the border. You know, there was some sort of conversation. So to, to address that, we have um, a helpline uh, number which you can call at the US border. Uh, so we try to adjust and react to the situation as quickly as we can. But unfortunately, I guess we can only hope for, for the better for the future. And maybe just one last question, uh, if for, for Tam and Rosie, if you just had like one or one or two top tips in terms of like going about the application process and people thinking of submitting their or looking to submit their applications next month, um, that'd be great. Who wants to go first? Um, uh, I think like we've sort of mentioned all of this already, but to summarise, I would say summarise. Um, really do your research, plan ahead, talk to people, um, your professors and your friends or anyone that you know, like just kind of find out uh, a bit more information, uh, apply, just apply, like, you know, think about your story, but apply, like, and, and go for it and all the best of luck. Rosie, are you are you still with us? Yeah. Rosie, I think you're still muted. Are we having some internet issues? Tom, do we have any more questions at this stage? I can I can probably jump in. I think um, no, I think that's actually it for questions. I think people have got to the it's half past and decided to stop asking questions. Okay, well, um, we've we've done really well. Um, I think well, um, Rosie, Rosie and Tom have provided fantastic advice. Uh, well, thank you very much for helping me out and helping um, our potential abilities out as well. Um, it's it's been it's been great having you. Um, also, thank you to everyone who um, is still with us, who has attended the event today. Um, if, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, drop us an email at programs at fullbright.org.uk. We will be very happy to help you and provide as much assistance as we can. And I guess at this stage, I can only reiterate what Tam has just said. Uh, if in doubt, give it a go. It does require quite a lot of work, but in terms of finances, you... Um, there are no financial obligations to us. Uh, so, you know, the worst case scenario is that, well, you, you can try again next year. Uh, but um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, receiving your applications. And once again, thank you very much for your attention. Bye-bye, everyone.